Hello and welcome. We're pleased to have people joining from all over the world to take part in a conversation about speeding the development of life-changing treatments for progressive MS. We'll also be talking about COVID-19 and MS. What do we know about the experiences of people with MS who have contracted the virus, and how should people with progressive MS be minimizing their risk? My name is John Strum, and I'm joining you from Los Angeles, California in the United States. I'm a volunteer for the International Progressive MS Alliance. The Alliance is an unprecedented global collaboration. It includes 19 MS organizations, hundreds of researchers and health professionals, the pharmaceutical industry, companies, foundations, donors, and people affected by progressive MS. In short, the Alliance has brought the world together to solve progressive MS. As a volunteer, I have the honor of serving on the Alliance's Scientific Steering Committee. My wife, Jean, lived with progressive MS for many years and was severely affected by this complex, challenging, and difficult disease. My role in the Alliance is to bring the perspectives and voices of people affected by MS to every aspect of the research and work, ensuring the Alliance is always focused on where the most life-changing impact can be achieved. I also host Real Talk MS, a podcast that reaches thousands of people in more than 90 countries around the world with information and tools to help people affected by MS live their best lives. If you're watching this webcast, you likely know that ending progressive multiple sclerosis is an urgent and unmet need. With me today are leading MS experts who are working to find life-changing solutions. Professor Alan Thompson, is the Pro Vice Provost and Dean of the Faculty of Brain Sciences at University College London. As a scientist and neurologist, Professor Thompson's main area of expertise is in the diagnosis, evaluation, and management of the progressive forms of multiple sclerosis. He also serves as Chair of the Scientific Steering Committee of the Progressive MS Alliance. Professor Maria Pia Sormano, Sormani, excuse me, specializes in biostatistics at the University of Genoa in Italy. Her main research interest is focused on the methodological problems of clinical studies in multiple sclerosis. Professor Sormani is also currently co-leading research in Italy to understand the outcomes of people with MS that have had COVID-19. Dr. Tim Cutsey is the National MS Society's Chief Advocacy, Services, and Research Officer in the United States. He leads the society's work in state and federal advocacy, delivery of services for people with MS, and the organization's global research programs. Dr. Kutsi is also a member of the Alliance's Scientific Steering Committee. Thank you all for joining me today, and let's get started. These have been challenging times for people throughout the world, and it's been particularly hard for people with MS who have had to deal with a chronic disease while we're in the midst of a global pandemic. So I wanna start with a bit of good news from each of our panelists. In terms of progressive MS, what is one thing that people can be inspired by in terms of treatment and research? Professor Sormani? Uh, you know, uh, if I uh, give a short answer to this big question, I would talk about uh, multidisciplinarity. This, this is a key word for me for solving problems in progressive MS. Uh, and I think that this is something that uh, the Progressive Alliance is trying to do, putting together people with different expertise, because uh, progressive MS is a complex disease and we have faced how multi multidisciplinary approach is important for facing COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I think that um, the joint effort of different kind of as experts is the key point for solving problems for progressive MS. Uh, Professor Thompson, same question. So I, I, I be tempted to give a somewhat similar answer to Maria Pia, but I think that for me, the most inspirational thing is that progressive MS is now center stage. It's um, the eyes of the MS world are on progressive MS. It is seen as the one key area that we now need to solve. So it's gone from being perhaps a little forgotten about to being center stage. Once that happens, and when you bring in what Maria Pia has been talking about, then you can really look at 
new ways of, of treating the condition and new, new mechanisms underpinning progression. But the key thing is that we have it in our focus and that's where all our attentions lie. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kutsi, would you like to give us an answer to the same question as well? Sure. So I, I, I will say I, I share Maria Pia and Alan's perspectives on this. And so what I would add to it is, is two things. One, one is the multidisciplinarity that uh, Maria Pia uh, referenced and, and the focus that Alan uh, you know, referred to are, are also then bringing it, are, when they come together, give us another component, which is speed. We are moving faster collectively rather than individually. And so the attention and multidisciplinary approach is accelerating progress. The other thing that I would say is has different, has distinguished the progressive MS movement over the last few years is the engagement of people affected by progressive MS in the work, in the conversation, in setting the strategy as you do, John. Uh, and so now it's really a truly full picture where it's the scientists and people with progressive MS working together faster to solve the problem. There are a number of treatments for relapsing forms of MS, and it looks like we'll see even more in the near future. Professor Thompson, where are we in terms of treatments for progressive forms of MS? Well, I think the most important uh, thing to say here is that we have some treatment. So the good news is that in the last literally two or three years, we have moved from virtually no effect of treatments uh, to having treatments which have some effect. And that, of course, means that we think about the condition differently. It is no longer untreatable. The other side of this is that the treatments we do have, and I'm thinking of ocrelizumab for primary progressive MS and more recently saponamod for secondary progressive MS, and actually also opening up some of the relapsing remitting treatments, which may be useful in uh, more active inflammatory forms of secondary progressive MS. That, that's all fine, but they all tend to focus on the on inflammation, on one aspect of uh, progressive MS, which allows it to have some effect, but not quite the effect that we, we might wish for. So positive, we have some treatments, uh, but this is, it's early days. This is the beginning of, of a, a positive trajectory. Speaking of that trajectory, Dr. Kutzi, do we see anything promising in the near future? So, yes, there is. So to, to, to build on what Alan uh, shared, so we have uh, clinical trials of a drug called mesinitib uh, that are being, is, is, are being evaluated in people with progressive MS. Uh, a couple of other companies have actually started phase three clinical trials of, of new treatments that target um, different parts of the immune system that Alan alluded to. Uh, in progressive MS, and, and these are sizable investments, you know, tens of millions of dollars in large international phase three clinical trials that build on the progress we've made uh, and what we've learned from the work in developing ocrelizumab and saponamod and, and some of these other treatments that um, are modestly effective, but the, the insights from those clinical trials now are informing as we design new clinical trials. So there is reason to be optimistic uh, that um, we will see yet more treatments moving through the drug development pipeline going forward. I, I'd also point out that, you know, we also have important work being done in terms of trials looking at rehabilitative informations, interventions that can improve quality of life. And so as we think about our agenda, it's, it's both about the drug treatments that we can do, but then other types of interventions that people with progressive MS can take advantage of and we need to, we're doing some large studies there. We obviously need to do more. Well, we certainly want to celebrate these advances, but what is it going to take to have effective therapies for all people with progressive MS? Professor Thompson? Well, I think um, I, I mentioned earlier that we have some drugs that are focusing on inflammation. So the effect of these drugs is relatively, relatively modest, say 20, 25% effect. What we really need are drugs that are going to have a, an, an effect on neurodegeneration, that are really going to protect the uh, central nervous system and that are going to help repair the central nervous system. When we get to that stage, uh, then we will have truly effective treatments and actually we can start thinking about how we might, might be able to stop or even uh, prevent progressive MS. 
So first, we need to understand progression because it helps us zero in on potential treatments. It can help stop nerve damage and repair damage that's already occurred. And second, we need faster clinical trials. Let's start with this first one, Dr. Ketsi. The Alliance has launched two international collaborative research networks that are focused on treatments that can protect and repair the nervous system. How are they trying to solve this challenge and what progress have they achieved? So that's right, John. So, I mean, one of our, one of our agendas, a key part of our agenda within the Alliance is to accelerate the development of new treatments. That means we need new treatments and the discovery of new treatments. And so through our collaborative network programs, we, we called on the, the scientific community to come together to collaborate and, and really work together to find new treatments. And within that, we have two, what we call a drug discovery networks that are focused on this problem of developing new treatments. One is led by Professor Giampito Martino in Italy that is bringing together a team that is very focused on treatments that can protect the brain from damage, as well as treatments that can promote myelin repair. Um, what, what their team is doing is, is starting from the standpoint of looking at the, the universe of what we know about MS, progressive MS, and the biological pathways that may be involved, and trying to understand which aspects of the, those biological pathways could be targets for us to, for a treatment that could either pr prevent nerve cells from dying or promoting myelin repair. And then, and what they do is they use these computer models to then try to discover new drugs from collections of drugs that exist out there that can potentially be predictive of what may happen uh, in, uh, in a clinical trial for either protect, protection or myelin repair. Um, at this point, um, they, they um, have been doing what we call screening of uh, libraries or co essentially collections of drugs and trying to identify using a computer, which one of these drugs may actually be um, a potential treatment for progressive MS. Um, using the, these advanced computing techniques, they've screened through over 1500 different potential compounds. Uh, they've identified 32 what we call front runners. These are candidate uh, treatments that need to move through through additional testing and using um, very specific um, tools that they develop, they've created all, what they call their MS in the laboratory, where they're able to, in fact, evaluate which one of these compounds, these front runners, might be able to either promote myelin growth or protect nerve cells from damage. And that those experiments help set the stage then for moving which of those front runners are most effective into trials in, in people. Our second team is led by uh, Professor uh, Francisco Quintana, who is, uh, works out of Harvard, but has a, also a multidisciplinary team. He's focused on a different aspect of uh, progressive MS, and that's targeting a specific part of our immune system, which may be involved in progressive MS, and, and, and trying to identify drugs that can really prevent that immune system from malfunctioning in progressive MS as we think uh, it does. Um, Within Dr. Quintana's team, they've, again, established a pipeline to identify drug treatments that can get into the brain, target this aspect of the immune system, and then evaluate which one of those might have properties uh, as potential treatments going forward. Um, their progress is really exciting. They've, um, they've identified at this point three candidates that can reduce disease activity in model systems of this immune system dysfunction. Um, they're looking at additional compounds to see, identify additional front runners as, as, as Dr. Martino has, uh, and actually have identified a potential drug called Megillostat, which, may, which has uh, promising features that can move into clinical trials. And one thing also is Dr. Quintana's work was also exceptionally innovative and recently was awarded uh, the 2019 Baranczyk Prize for Innovation and Research, which really um, recognizes exceptional originality and innovation and it's really a, an exciting to see that one of our, one of the investigators funded through the Alliance was recognized with that honor. So the two drug discovery networks have been successful in finding a number of potential therapies that could help revolutionize progressive MS treatment. But even the most promising of these would still have to go through the clinical trial process. Clinical trials take a long time and, and they cost so much. 
Professor Soleimani, what work is being done to make trials faster and less expensive? Yeah, this is a very hot topic in, in MS research because the main problem we have for testing new drugs is how to measure, how to assess disability progression. And it's, it's, uh, it sounds crazy because I think that every MS patient can easily tell what it means for, for himself, for herself, uh, uh, his disability progression. For us who, who need to measure that, it's, it's really a problem because disability progression is a mixed um, compound of different kind of, uh, of events and uh, it's a really noisy measure. So uh, what the Alliance is trying to do is to find what we call as a biomarker. So an objective measure that, that, that can predict the clinical progression. So at this aim, uh, the Alliance founded a big grant to a highly multidisciplinary group. This is, this is really a good group of people with different expertise. And the aim is to put together all the imaging uh, we have collected during clinical trials in progressive MS. So all the, the MRI images were collected, put together uh, by the Doug Arnold group at the McGill University in Canada. And this is a very good group because Doug Arnold has a very good expertise in analyzing MRI data and in developing new methods for analyzing them. So the aim is putting together all this uh, large data set and to apply new methodology based on artificial intelligence methods to try to identify an algorithm, a score, a method uh, to predict uh, using integrated imaging data to predict disability progression, which is the best combination of these features that can predict uh, progression. Um, uh, many different uh, experts are working together from different countries in the world. And, um, you know, um, artificial intelligence is something that is very up to date now. Everybody's talking about artificial intelligence, but uh, artificial intelligence method has been very successful in solving uh, easy perception problems. So in recognizing faces, uh, recognizing uh, writing, uh, reading, uh, translating, uh, uh, languages, but in the medical field, it, it is very much more challenging because as you can imagine, the MRI images are not pictures. Uh, the, the MRI images are, are acquired with different parameters, so they're not fully standardized using different machine. You have to uh, correct for different acquisition parameters. So all these kind of problems must be solved before applying uh, these artificial intelligence methods, because uh, also an artificial intelligence to learn must have must have a good uh, sample of things to, <laughs> to to learn on. And the second problem is the number. You know, uh, recognizing faces is a successful task because we have at our disposal millions, billions of images. Uh, images are easily collected by taking a picture; they are posted on the web. So. It's something that it's very easy to achieve, but this is not the case for medical images. You, you know how long does it take to uh, it takes to acquire an MRI scan, and uh, I mean there are pro issues related to to privacy uh, of patients. So uh, this project, uh, led by Doug Arnold, is a very ambitious project, and uh, it will be able to collect enough uh, images to apply this artificial intelligence methodology. So the project is at an advanced stage. So um, the different databases have been already integrated and some sample uh, methodology has been run. You know, another issue that, it's, uh, that we faced is that putting together biomedical engineer, informaticians and, uh, and neurologists sometimes cause problems of communication. So, uh, you know, um, this is something that must be solved. And for solving that, we have just to talk as much as we can all together, uh, solving the problems together. And this is a very, very nice process. And I really hope that uh, we will succeed in finding something, finding something useful for, for people with MS and for speeding up the conduction of clinical trials. Well, this is encouraging progress on overcoming the two big challenges in developing new life-changing treatments. I have to ask you, Professor Thompson, as chair of the Alliance Scientific Steering Committee, 
How has COVID-19 affected the work of these three international research networks? Well, of course, the impact of this pandemic has been has been huge on, on all, all laboratory work, all university activities. So it's had a, a major impact on the networks, particularly the drug discovery networks. Um, and basically, they're either had to stop from mid-March or they're working at very limited capacity. Um, we've been meeting with each of the network leads to evaluate the status of their work and have been uh, uh, understand that actually they're all going to be able to resume and move ahead in the very near future. Each network will have a unique plan to get back to full operations and have adjusted milestones for completing the projects. There will inevitably be some, some delays. However, they've all provided the assurance that they're confident they will achieve their intended outcomes. And in the next few months, we'll get a better grasp of exactly what the revised plans look like, and perhaps more importantly, what we can do to support their success and make sure they achieve what they have set out to achieve. Well, COVID-19 is impacting people with MS in a myriad of ways, including slowing, but thankfully not stopping vital research. That leads us to our other big question for today. What are we learning about COVID-19 and MS? I know there have been significant efforts to gather information on the experiences of people with MS who have contracted the virus. Uh, Professor Sormani, Italy was one of the first countries to have to deal with the pandemic. Tell me about your efforts there regarding people with MS. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Italy was probably the first uh, country in Europe to be hit strongly by the virus. And, uh, you know, uh, all the medical doctors were completely involved by managing the pandemic. And uh, we, as a, as a group of statisticians, we, we really wanted to do something. And uh, so the only thing that we could do is collecting data. So we started, we started an initiative and again, um, during the pandemic to, to carry on this initiative, we need the help of, of a lot of people. And we had this kind of help. Um, for example, we had the, a platform for collecting the data that was donated by Roche, that is a pharma company who, I mean, simply donated the platform. It gave us an instrument, a working instrument that would have taken a, a lot of time to be set up. And the pla platform is a web-based, method to collect data so that all the neurologists can insert the data into the platform and the data are immediately collected in a unique database. So they are immediately ready for the analysis and they can be easily corrected, revised and, um, and, and analyzed during, during the time. So in Italy, this initiative started. Uh, a lot of uh, Italian uh, MS centers were involved. So we launched the call to all the, the MS neurologists to join the initiative and to uh, put the data of people with MS affected by COVID-19 into the platform. Uh, and we started at the beginning of March and now we, we have more than 1000 uh, patients into the platform, not just from Italy, but also from other countries because the platform is open, it's an open system. So everybody can join the initiative and put their data into, into the system. Uh, among the Italian population, we, we, we have now 835 patients. Most of them are relapsing remitting, but we collected also data of 140 progressive MS patients. Uh, um, I was also very impressed about the participation of, the, of this part of the, of the MS population. Uh, we had a, a large response of progressive MS patients who were contacted in rehabilitation centers and uh, by, by clinicians. They all responded, uh, giving their support to the initiative. I mean, uh, uh, what we learn about, about COVID-19 in MS, I think that the first thing that we learned is that we didn't see any uh, alarming signal. You know, MS is a complex disease and people with MS are uh, treated with, with a number of treatment with really different mechanisms of action interacting with the immune system. So there was a, a great concern about the, the possibility of having a higher risk of a, of a severe COVID-19 uh, course in, in people with MS. But this was not really the case, talking on the average. But also in the progressive MS group, that is, of course, uh, the group at the higher risk uh, 
not because they, are, they have progressive MS, but because they usually are older people with a comorbidity because MS is a comorbidity. And we know that in the general population, uh, this kind of people are at higher risk of COVID-19. Anyway, between the 140 uh, that we had in our cohort, 90 of them did not require any hospitalization. So among 140, 90 patients had COVID-19, they had progressive MS, and they uh, had a very mild disease course. And among the 40 patients who were hospital hospitalized, 30 fully recovered. So of course we have a mortality of 7% in our cohort. That is not that high. I mean, it's uh, really comparable to the mortality rate of the normal population of the same age. And of course, same disability because progressive MS people have some disability that expose them to some uh, to, to more complication. So I can say that the, the, the signal emerging from this uh, analysis is quite reassuring. Of course, people uh, with, uh, with progressive MS must be very careful, uh, as all uh, people with, with similar conditions. So uh, in case of uh, new waves of pandemics, they, I mean, they observe the, the usual rules of, uh, of attention. Uh, but I mean, they, they shouldn't be uh, worried, too much worried about, about this pandemic, more worried than, I mean, than the other people. Uh, I think this can be the message that uh, can that comes from from this large study. Dr. Kutzi, th there have also been efforts worldwide to capture critical information about people with MS who have had COVID-19. Can you highlight some of that work? Sure. So I think the the certainly the work that our Italian colleagues had led the way, and the you know, the MS international community came together quite quickly really organized under the auspices of the MS International Federation and our member societies. You know, the, 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 the medical professionals who advise these MS organizations, the scientific staff, their leaders all came together in, in really an unprecedented manner. In, in literally days, people from around the world came together to develop guidelines and provide guidance for what people with MS should be considering. Doctors um, were, were coming together to share information and insights because this is a new disease and so a new virus, new disease. And so we, there were many unknowns that came very quickly. And so at first there was a lot of information, you know, based on limited information, limited data, we had limited experience, but now as a result of the MS member organizations, the world's MS experts, the uh, professional organizations like Ectrims, Actrims, and all the various professional organizations that bring MS researchers together, the World Health Organization, um, along with really the, the registries that many countries have established um, to capture the information like uh, Dr. Sormani has referenced. You know, all of that is being captured individually within countries um, and now is being brought together in a global effort so that we can understand collectively what, what this experience means. And you know, we've seen work in Argentina, we've seen work in Europe, in a, in a number of areas. Um, it is incredibly encouraging. And again, to reference my earlier point about speed, this has happened in an unbelievably fast manner, where in the past, things would have taken a long time to overcome. You know, barriers have, been, have really been broken through because of the sense of urgency. Um, that there was to really understand the impact of this disease and pandemic on people with MS and to bring clarity um, for people with MS around, and, and their healthcare professionals around how to approach this. Well, the global MS community has really rallied so people have the information they need to deal with this crisis. So what is the information telling us? Let's start with you, Professor Sormani, but I'm also going to ask Professor Thompson and Dr. Kutsi to comment as well. Um, well, uh, I think that for the future, uh, for progressive MS, we really need something new. And when, I, when I'm talking about new, I'm saying uh, something different than uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. You know, uh, and I think that th this global effort promoted by the, the Progressive Alliance is really focused on uh, targeting something new. Uh, you know, I don't, <laughs> I, when I say something new, I 
don't really uh, have in mind something specific. Uh, but, you know, it's, um, in my mind, it, it seems that we have to switch uh, uh, the paradigm and to, to change the approach. And I do hope that we are moving in this direction. Professor Thompson? So I, mean, I might just take a slightly different approach and say that what, what it's taught us uh, is how well we can work together, how quickly and effectively. Um, I, I think that we need to evaluate the problem and work out in a practical way how we deal with it. Uh, and I think in terms of, of, of managing our uh, MS and managing the, the condition that we, we don't make rash decisions, but we balance all the risks uh, before we actually take decisions and get expert advice before we do so. So I think, I mean, that sounds maybe a little boring, but I think it's a, a practical and pragmatic approach that we can take internationally, uh, learning from each other. And I think we've done that remarkably well. Uh, Dr. Cutsey? You know, I'll, I'll build on Alan's comment. I, I think the COVID experience has illustrated how the MS community can come together to both quickly try to understand what we know, what we don't know, and how to share that information with professionals around the world, as well as people with MS, to equip people with MS to understand how to manage their disease and what steps they should be taking uh, around this. Uh, you know, I think the when you step back also and look at COVID-19 and its impact on our, on our, uh, on, on the global community and the global research community, MS, as well as other areas, I think we're seeing what can happen when, when there is a focused effort to, to solve problems and to understand what, what we know and don't know and do it in as quickly and as focused a manner that sets aside personal interests and personal sort of scientific agendas. Um, it is something that this pandemic has illustrated very powerfully in a really a remarkable way. And my hope is that what we learn from this is that we can take some of what's worked exceptionally well uh, and to replicate it in MS and other, in progressive MS and other areas. Uh, you know, I think the, the, um, the pandemic has also taught us um, the importance of understanding how our words move across the globe quickly and how guidance in one part of the world quickly spreads to other parts of the world through the power of the internet, social media, and other pieces. And I think, you know, when we step back and reflect, we'll also understand how critical it is that we quickly communicated trustworthy information that people can, can use systematically, and that um, the speed with which, you know, information was needed is something that I think we're still adapting to. Well, Dr. Cutsey, I'm glad you brought up the issue of guidance. If people with progressive MS are at higher risk of contracting COVID-19, what should they be keeping in mind? What should they be doing? Certainly. So let me clarify a thing, and I, hope, I just want to underscore something Dr. Sormani highlighted, is that having progressive MS in and of itself is not necessarily predisposing someone to, to contracting COVID. Um, what the data is telling us is that we're all at risk of developing COVID and some of the other diseases we may have along with potentially having progressive MS could potentially have an impact on, on, on the outcome. So I think it's important to underscore that aspect of it. Um, but I think what I would encourage individuals to do is, you know, either visit their MS Society's website or also visit the MS International Federation's website where there is quite a bit of uh, really actionable information people can use. You know, we, we are advising that, you know, individuals, you know, take steps to reduce the risk of infection and follow the World Health Organization's recommendations, which are really quite common sense of washing hands frequently, avoiding touching eyes nose in their nose or mouth unless your hands are clean, practicing social distancing of at least one meter between yourself and others. I'll stipulate, I know John, John and I were discussing, not necessarily being done effectively in many countries, but really practicing social distancing can really prevent people from, from, from getting the disease, uh, avoiding, crowd, avoiding crowded places and you know, practicing food safety and the like. Um, you know, we're recommending, you know, and this, many of the authorities are recommending wearing a face covering or face mask in public and avoiding big public gatherings, crowds and public transportation. You know, if possible, using alternative alternatives to face-to-face -to -face, uh, routine um, medical appointments. You know, the, the other aspect is certain people might be at a slightly increased risk of becoming ill. Uh, and so it really, it, 
what we want to do is, you know, if, if a person has progressive MS or if they have MS and are over the age of 60 or have a higher level of disability or have other diseases along with their MS, like heart disease or lung disease, to really pay attention to exposure because exposure to COVID-19, if you're in those categories, really is it increase, creates some increased risk. But it's, it's really about taking the steps that each of us can do to prevent exposure which is the most common sense thing that I think most individuals could do. What about individuals that are on some form of disease modifying treatment? Uh, Professor Thompson, as a neurologist treating people with MS, what guidance is being provided? Well, John, I mean, the first thing to say is that many, many people are on disease modifying treatments, effective treatments that are making a major difference to their, uh, to their MS. And yet we know that for a variety of reasons, some people have stopped their treatments as a result of this, often quite unnecessarily. So I think there's been a, quite a lot of guidance has been provided. There have been studies done in a number of countries, in Spain, in, in Holland, uh, and se several of these studies have already been published. There's quite detailed information on the MS International Federation website. I mean, we know that many disease-modifying treatments work by suppressing or modifying the immune system, and so some MS med medications may increase the likelihood of developing complications from a, a COVID-19 infection. But this, this risk needs to be balanced with the risks of stopping or delaying treatment. And that's really important. So some of the recommendations, which again are, are quite common sense, but aren't always adhered to, is that people with MS currently taking disease-modifying treatments should continue with their treatment. People who develop symptoms of COVID-19 or test positive for the infection discuss their MS therapies with their MS care provider or another healthcare professional who is familiar with their care. So they have those discussions before taking any, any decisions. I think for people who are starting on any new treatments, uh, they must uh, discuss with their healthcare professional which therapy is the best choice for their individual disease course and disease activity in, in light of COVID-19 risk in, in the region. So there, I think one may be looking at slightly different choices or different balances, and that's a really important discussion, but that's for people that are starting on treatment for the first time. So overall, no rush decisions, no rash decisions, and just thinking th things through carefully and going for a balanced approach, managing risk effectively. Well, this data collection about how COVID-19 impacts MS is ongoing. What are some of the future questions that this work might address, Dr. Kutsi? Certainly, and I imagine Dr. Somani has something to say on this too. I think that, you know, first of all, this data collection is critical because what it will do is it will give us the insights that help us update our advice. I mean, our advice is based initially on limited information. The more we know, the more experience we have, the more contemporary our advice will be. A couple of other key questions that we need to be prepared for is as treatments for COVID-19 are developed, we will need to understand how they interact with MS treatments and the effect they may have on those MS treatments. Again, this is a new disease, so there's a lot we don't know about these innovative treatments and their interaction with other treatments a person may be taking. Um, another key question is, relates to the vaccine. When a vaccine is available, you know, there's a, there are important questions about how it will interact and what it will mean for individuals who are at high risk um, what it means for individuals who have MS, who may have been on a, one or different types of treatments. You know, the, the critical issue is that we'll, we will need to understand it, but that's where this, these kind of data collection efforts and these systematic studies that are being conducted will be very important. You know, the, the most important thing I would say for individuals listen, watching um, this, this um, webcast is to continually visit their, um, their organization's websites and to really understand and see what's happening. Visiting the MS International Federation website is a great resource, which will have the latest guidance as well as their home countries, their MS organizations uh, website. Well, on today's webcast, we've seen the power of global collaboration. When we can get everyone working together to solve the most complex challenges, we can accelerate progress, whether it's finding a life-changing treatment or ensuring that people have the best information available regarding COVID-19. 
And as we come to our session's close, I'd like to ask each of our guests what the future holds when it comes to developing new treatments for progressive MS. Where do we need to focus next, Professor Sormani? And again, I'd like Dr. Kutsi and Professor Thompson to comment on this as well. I think we must uh, absolutely continue to collaborate and to improve the global collaboration uh, between experts from different fields. But also I think that it will be crucial in the future, the collaboration with the mass patients themselves. Because, you know, uh, sometimes I realize that uh, as a research community, we are sometimes a bit too rigid. We are used to uh, use always the same thing. Uh, we are familiar with uh, certain measures, certain scales. And I do think that uh, an interaction, a, a more close interaction with patients with MS can really help us in uh, better characterizing the disease and speed up the process of testing treatments. Dr. Kutsi? So I think Dr. Sormani touched on what, what I think is a critical area that is part, certainly part of our ongoing work in the Alliance, but I know is part of our future as well as many scientists. And, and that is getting deeper understanding around what is happening in progression, understanding disease, the, what progressive MS is, the disease, and all the different processes that contribute to what we know as progressive MS. Being able to have that clarity um, will help us identify which are the part, how early we can intervene to prevent disease progression from happening and really stopping uh, progressive MS a, as early as possible. That requires us to you know, do some more work and study and understand, but that foundational knowledge will enable us to, to discover the treatments that will transform the disease uh, as, we, as we hope to for the future. Professor Thompson. So, I mean, I, I, I'm not left with too much to say, but I, so I absolutely agree that understanding mechanism of progression is critical, developing and identifying new targets. And I think that is the work that's going on through the networks uh, and through the alliance, but that needs to continue. And it, it's, it's absolutely fundamental. If I was to think of one other thing, it is to look at all the other factors which make progression worse and, and over which we have control. And I'm thinking about things like smoking and various other. I, I think paying particular attention to this at the same time as we are sorting out the underlying mechanisms is uh, it would be a really good idea. Well, the International Progressive MS Alliance is rallying the worldwide MS community and fueling important research to get effective treatments to people who need them. The Alliance continues to inspire hope and make progress. And still, we must and will do more to end progressive MS. Thank you to our panel of experts, Professor Thompson, Professor Sormani, and Dr. Kutsi. And thank you for joining us today. Please stay connected to the Alliance through our regular webcasts and your MS organization. And please share the work of the Alliance with others. We need everyone to be a part of this effort because together we are stronger than progressive MS.